Hey everyone, welcome back to the Athlete CEO Podcast. We're your hosts, Brandon and Eric Averill. As you know, we're the co-founders of AWM Capital, where we believe that you are the greatest driver of your net worth. We call this your human capital. And so this podcast, the Athlete CEO Podcast, is dedicated to bringing you the knowledge, the skills, and access to world-class experts to help you unlock the full potential of your human capital. Today, we have the privilege of sitting down with one of the leading experts in positive psychology and somebody that I know we're all excited to hear from, Smiranda Lowry. Smiranda is a currently an assistant professor at Providence College. Uh, she has her PhD in psychological and brain scientist from UCSB. She's the spouse of a former NFL player. Uh, so I know we're all excited to, to dive in with Miranda. She's also the founder of UCSB's Resilience Summit and had a tremendous amount of experience as we've navigated these waters of COVID. Uh, I'm really looking forward to diving into positive psychology, one of her specialties, uh, also parenting, uh, something that I found absolutely fascinating when we first met. Um, so with that, welcome to the podcast. We're excited to have you, Miranda. Thanks. I'm so excited to be here. So as I kind of led on, we first met um, at an event, one of our venture partners. Um, I came home immediately and told Eric, hey, uh, yeah, they're sure there were a bunch of athletes there. And those are, you know, the people that we work with and surround ourselves with. But the most fascinating person I actually met is somebody that I wouldn't have expected to meet at one of these conferences. So it was such a pleasant surprise. Um and, you know, where I would love to start is just your background. Um, you know, I would say how, you know, you're an immigrant to the U.S. How, how did you get here? Um, what was that experience like? Where does positive psychology fit in? So I know that's a broad ranging probably topic, but I would love to just start there at the very beginning. That is quite, quite <laughs> a bit. Um, yeah. So I'm originally from Romania. And I left Romania with my parents. So I was kind of just along for that ride. Uh, we lived in Hungary for a little bit in sort of underground tunnel sort of situation. We were hiding out in somebody's apartment. Ended up in Austria where we were in refugee camps um, as political refugees for about three years. And then we ended up in Connecticut. I went to my undergrad in Connecticut and stayed there until I met my husband my freshman year of college. And then he sort of dragged me around in a lot of places before I took him to Santa Barbara, beautiful Santa Barbara for, for my grad school. Um, and now we just made the long trek back across uh, to the other side. Um, and we're in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, but in terms of positive psychology, it's funny, some of the research that I'm doing now is actually based in my personal experiences and, and something that I learned from my parents. So being an immigrant in Austria was really difficult. Um, hopefully things have gotten better now, but when I was a child, people were openly very racist. So it was things like um, I wasn't allowed to participate in gym class because they didn't want me wearing shorts. Um, I had to take a separate bus to school. And sort of the one memory that really sticks out from that time is my first grade teacher who made me lick food off the ground one day when I dropped it and sort of made this comment to the whole class that, you know, I'm, immigrants are like dogs and they need to be treated as such. But what was really interesting was that, you know, my parents didn't let me sort of, you know, stay in that negative space for too long. Like they, they were very open about like, okay, this is going on and it's very difficult, but you know what? You're still in that school. You're still getting good grades. All the other students and all the other kids around you, like they're not going through all that and you are, and you're getting through it and you're still there. So kind of pat yourself on the back. Um, so that's really influenced. I think you know, positive psychology, um, maybe because of the name, but it, it's gotten so much attention in recent years in podcasts or in the popular media and blogs and all over the place. And I think sometimes people think that it's all about happiness and having this Pollyanna smile on your face all the time. And it's really not. It's much more, you know, humans are much more complicated than that. And um, emotions are much more complicated. And I think, you know, what my research shows and what my personal experiences shows is sometimes our biggest strengths really come from our biggest struggles, from our failures and, you know, from that teacher who made you feel humiliated. Like that's still a source of strength every day. I actually, even on my desk right now, I have this kind of little 
I don't know, little picture that I made in first grade. And it just, it reminds me of that moment. And it doesn't make me feel bad anymore. It makes me feel kind of badass. Like, yeah, I'm still here. So, you know, so sorry for my language. I took that in a totally different direction, but. <laughs> no, that's fantastic. And I think, you know, it's no secret. I mean, we're this country specifically, and and let's not even touch the world is dealing with a, a racism problem. And, um, and really, I think being brought to the surface for so many people, unfortunately, you know, in this time. And so, you know, I think it's great to to focus on that. And the positive psychology isn't ignoring the pain, right? And I would love to hear you hit on that a little bit of, you know, it's okay to probably be angry, but how do we, how do we now, how do you navigate those waters, whether it is racism, whether it is anger around being locked down because of some virus that we have no control over, or, you know, how bad things happen, you know, I, I would imagine it's okay to be upset about that, but how do you use positive psychology to move beyond that? How do you use it so that way you look at a picture from the first grade and not have so much hate and ill will uh, in that moment? Yeah. So there's this um, really famous psychologist from 150 years ago named William James. And, you know, there's a lot of really great quotes from him, but Basically, he said that we can't really control our environments. We can't always control our circumstances, but we can always control how we respond and react to them. So can I give you just like a little bit of my personal definition of positive psychology with that just to like set the stage a little bit? So the way that I think of positive psychology is always in relationship to what I call traditional psychology or business as usual psychology. So Traditional psychology really came to power in this country after World War II. There was a lot of government money coming in to help soldiers that were coming back and dealing with things like PTSD. As such, it really adopted a medical kind of disease model. So people were seen as weak or fragile and casualties of battered environments or sort of a combination of all these bad things. And it was really about how do we help these people? How do we make it better? And I think that's been really great. You know, there's a lot of um, mental illnesses and diseases that in the past were completely untreatable. Now we have some cures. We have treatments that work and make people's lives better. So for me, traditional psychology is sort of how do we take somebody who's suffering? How do we take somebody who's at a negative eight and maybe bring them up to a negative three or a negative two or somebody who's at a negative two and bring them to the to a zero? So that's kind of been the the, the good side of, of where psychology has been. Unfortunately, I think what it means is we've sort of forgotten the flips to pay attention to the flip side of the coin. So how do we take somebody who maybe isn't in about a depression, isn't in about of of, um, anxiety, but maybe they're just not living, you know, this is an overused uh, phrase, but they're not living their best life. You know, somebody who's just kind of languishing. How do we help them flourish? How do we take them from a five to a 10, from an eight to a 10, from a five to an eight, whatever it might be. So sort of, you know, helping people um, to kind of live up to their potential. Um, And for me, I always think about myself and I always think about everybody as, as drafts, right? Like of, of, that we can constantly work on and improve and, you know, drafts of hopefully better versions of ourselves. But I think, you know, one of the things that I always tell my students um, and my research assistants is life is hard. It really is. And some people have it easier and some people have it harder, but it's hard for everyone. And I think a lot of people hide their struggles, but everyone deals with something, whether it's money issues or sicknesses or secret, you know, anxiety and depression, like we've all got issues and life is a roller coaster. There's going to be better times and there's going to be really shitty times. And then there's, you know, racism pandemics and then there's COVID pandemics. And I think, you know, the things that I, what, one of the things that's really great about positive psychology is it's very much like tools based. So I give you tools, I give you a toolkit, I give you practices, you figure out what works for you and hopefully they become habits and they're intended to sort of make things better during good times, but also help you during difficult times. Like you said, you know, when we're dealing with difficult things like COVID and racism and everything else going in the world. So it's sort of, also builds resilience. What's resilience, right? It's it's the ability to sort of bounce back in difficult situations or even be better after a difficult situation, right? Like there's people doing research now on post-traumatic growth. Oh my gosh, I talk so much. So I like I said, you gotta like move, you gotta stop me at some point because I just keep going. 
<laughs> no, it's it's so great. And I, I think maybe a good tangent to take from there is because I, I love that, right? Traditional psychology, dealing with what we all think of off top of our heads, people dealing with depression, but more towards this, you know, make people that are already good, but dealing with some issues a little bit better. It, I would love to hear, obviously, being married to somebody who's competing at an extremely high level. You said you guys met freshman year in college, so you saw every up and down. Uh, so maybe we'll start speaking to the wives right now. Um, but, you know, how do you take what you've learned and maybe some tips and tools for, you know, people that are supporting the athlete? I would love to know supporting not only the athlete, but also maybe even potentially raising families. I'll throw in too that the first time we met, the question that set my interest off in our conversation was, you know, how am I screwing up my kids and how, you know, how can I not screw them up? Um, so I'd love to just hear you talk about being a spouse and, I, you know, you mentioned you didn't have children yet, but I'm sure you could speak to that. How are you a good parent through, you know, supporting somebody playing at a high elite level? Got you. Oh, that's a lot of questions. Yeah, um, I know. Sorry. No, it's okay. Gosh, I don't even know where to start. Uh, it was really difficult being the spouse of a professional athlete, um, especially, you know, I mean, just dealing with the uncertainty. Uncertainty is really hard to deal with. And I think that's part of why this past year has been so difficult for so many people. Um, but that's just a part of being, I think, in that professional athlete world that people don't realize, you know, you can get hurt, you can get, like, it's, it, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, but I think, you know, honestly, I think there's a lot of overlap between sports psychology, performance psychology, and positive psychology. And a lot of kind of the, the work that I do now and that other positive psychologists do, a lot of it athletes and coaches have been doing for a really long time. You know, they've, they've already kind of figured out this idea of mindset and, and uh, that, that we're kind of, the rest of us are just getting to now. So I will say that I've learned so much from my husband um, and his experience with, with being in the NFL. And he, you know, he was somebody, we, we both went to Yale, met freshman year of college and Yale's not a big time football school. He, he managed, you know, as we all know, um, he did get drafted in the sixth round, but then had some injuries. And there was a lot of sort of bouncing around. We we bounced to different cities and different teams. And I remember, you know, he'd go into work and then come back a couple hours later. And that was it. We'd have to like he'd be moving to a new city the next day and I'd have to pack up everything. And it's a lot. Um, but I was always so impressed by him because you know, no matter, you know, and he hates when I talk about this, but no matter how many times he got cut or fired or whatever you <laughs> want to call it, the next morning, he'd still, you know, set his alarm clock, wake up and, and still keep going. He knew he was really passionate about what he did. And he loved it, no matter what the external outcomes was for him. It was like, he just kept on pushing forward. Of course, now, you know, he's retired and he's like an 80 year old man getting out of bed in the morning because everything hurts and is achy. So I don't know, you know, how he's feeling about all that now. Um, but but there's something really, I think, has been just really wonderful for me to just see him um, be so passionate about something, care so much about something. And no matter what the outcomes, you just kind of keep going forward. So um but yeah, as, as a spouse, it's it's difficult. It's dealing with a lot of stress. Um, this was, you know, before I went to get my PhD and my master's in this stuff. So I didn't have the, the tools that I have today. And it's funny too. I mean, just thinking about my own life and you mentioned this UCSB resilience project that I put together. I was working with this really wonderful undergraduate student, Samantha Blodgett. And at the end, in one of our meetings, she said, you are the most optimistic person I've ever met. And I was, you know, it kind of took me a second. I was like, you know what? You're right. I am, which is kind of wild because I'm from Romania and the stereotypes, if you've heard about Eastern Europe, are true. We like to complain and, you know, we're kind of gloomy. And I st when I started teaching positive psychology and doing this research, I was getting really positive feedback from students saying, you know, this is the most life-changing class I've taken. This is why doesn't everyone get a class in this? And I was like, after a couple of years, I was like, maybe I should try the stuff that I'm teaching. And I took about a year where I dedicated a month to different kind of topics, whether it was gratitude or mindfulness. Um, and yeah, at the, at the end of it, at some point, I guess you, you know, your student, you, like you talk to a student, you're like, oh shit, this does work. Um, <laughs> again, I, I'm all over the place. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'm all over the place. 
No, I think that I think that's great. And I think, you know, kind of shifting because I asked you too many questions on kids like and you hit on it there. But the the um, the gratitude, I know that was the answer to one of them. But I would love to know. Yeah, I mean, right. We none of us want to screw up our kids. We're all going to screw up our kids. You know, especially, you know, we're talking to a lot of families that do have this uncertainty. How do you pack up a family and move them to another city potentially? You know, you're somebody that went through the extremes of that and your parents did such a fantastic job of like of reinforcing, it sounds like, that positivity with you. I would love to know, like, and maybe it's even repeating the advice you gave to me, but like, what are some things that that the parents, you know, amidst all this uncertainty, and I think, again, applies to everybody given the times of uncertainty, but like, what is some of the advice that you give to parents on raising kids in in the professional sports environment, the environment that we're currently living in? Yeah. So I don't, you know, honestly, I don't remember exactly what I said to you when, when we met, but I am, I am a parent. I have a son who just turned nine years old and a daughter whose birthday is next week and she'll be five. And you're right. As a parent, you feel like you're always screwing up and you're always worried and you're trying your best, but it never feels good enough. Um, when I was an undergrad, I worked with a famous psychologist, a developmental guy named Paul Bloom. And, you know, when I was pregnant with, with my son, Finley, I went and asked him for advice and he was basically like, mom and dad, they fuck you up. <laughs> so I was like, just come to terms with it. It. Um, no, but I think what's really great about my specific job and my career is that I get a lot of flexibility in what I do and especially in my research. So as a parent who wants to do their best, I've, I've really in the past few years, I've, I've switched a lot of my research where I am looking at parenting and parenting processes, especially, especially across different cultures. So one of my recent studies that's been really interesting is I was really curious of when you look at, you know, every year we get so much data, right? So we get data in terms of how do students do on academic tests like the PISA? How do they do in stuff like math and writing and science and so forth? And then we also get a lot of data on the happiest countries in the world and less happy countries and least happy countries. And one of the things that was really interesting to me, I started having a lot of conversations with my PhD advisor. She's originally from Korea. And what we saw is, you know, in in a place like Korea, the kids are doing so well academically and just completely, you know, beating us academically, but they're really not happy, um, not doing so well in terms of well-being. When you look at a place like the United States, they're just kind of like, eh, academically and like, eh, in terms of their well-being. And then you look at some places like in Northern Europe, um, so places like Denmark and Finland, and you've heard all the sort of news around this, but they're doing awesome academically and they're doing awesome in terms of their well-being. So that's where a lot of my research right now is like, what are we doing differently, whether it's in a school environment and what are parents doing differently? And and one of the things that I'm really noticing is that here in the United States, there's there's been a dramatic change in in sort of the culture of parenting. So we talk a lot. I mean, the United States is a highly independent, highly individualistic country. And we talk a lot about these ideas of individualism and we want our kids to be independent and we want them to, you know, kind of be their true selves and be unique and so forth. But then when you look at actual actions of parents, it tells a very different story. We've become in in the past couple decades, just increasingly more protective of our children. And I know it's very well intentioned, but you know, on one hand, we're telling them that they can do anything in the world and that they're their own person and they can like reach for the you know stars and whatever. And on the other hand, we're kind of handholding them along the way. I mean, you know, I have college kid, you know, college students I work with that are fabulous people and their parents still call up and still email to make sure their kids are doing their homework. And, you know, like my kids get in a fight on the playground and the parents kind of step in and give me really dirty looks because I'm not there to solve their arguments for them. So for one reason, I mean, I think there's many reasons for it, but as a culture in the United States, I think we've become a little bit too protective of our children. And one of the things that I see very differently in my data from Denmark, for example, is they really, you know, they don't talk so much about independence, individualism, but they give their kids a lot more opportunity for that. So you, you, I'm sure you've heard some of these stories, but just letting their kids ride their bike to school or going to the park on their own or using knives much earlier, just little things that, you know, I think 
in this country, like in my data, we see that parents sort of think of their kids as, as fragile, almost like butterflies that need protecting. And in my Danish data, parents really just think of kids as smaller versions of themselves. Like these are just little humans, but they're not, you know, there's not that big sort of difference between parent and kid. Um, so I think, you know, like some of the data uh, that's coming out, you ask American parents, at what age would you let your child go to the park on their own? And I think the average in my data was like 15.7 years. It's like, what 15 year old wants to go to the park on their own? Who wants to go to the park on their own at 15? Like they're over it. And then in my Danish data, it was like five. Um, so, so one thing that I think, um, I try to do with my own kids is give them a little bit more freedom. Um, and that means freedom to, to fail, whether that's, you know, falling off the bike, falling off the tree and scraping themselves, getting a bad grade in school, getting in a fight with a friend. I think we don't give kids and students enough opportunities to do that as kids. And then you get into life later on. And mom and dad can't protect you forever. And like I said before, bad stuff's going to happen. And if we've always been protected from it, we've not developed the skills to deal with that, right? Like you look at little, if you look at animals in the wild, one of the, one of the things you always see, it's adorable, but one of the things you always see is like they're always fighting with each other, right? And through that fighting, they're learning the skills that they'll need as adults. And it's sort of like we like protect, we don't let kids experience that. So the way I think of, the way I think of little failures and bruises and cuts and arguments with friends and all this stuff for little kids is like vaccines. You know, we're, everyone's talking about vaccines, but they're sort of vaccines that are giving them the skills, preparing them for later life, which will be hard because life is hard. Um, and I don't think we're doing enough of that. So it's funny because, you know, I, I do this research and then when it's, when it comes to my own kids, it's, it's different. It's hard to not want to do everything for the, you know, everything to protect them and to save them and to, I don't know. <laughs> and to worry that like, oh gosh, I just moved them across the country and took them away from their friends and they're living in, you know, a new, like, did I mess them up kind of thing where some of those experiences are really, the, the difficult experiences as a, a, that I had as a kid, I think have given me some of the biggest strengths. Um, and I, and I'm not, you know, I'm not talking about like trauma here. I'm talking about just like little, little, things. right. Yeah. No, uh, yeah, no, I think it's fascinating. And I, you keep, referring to data. And I think that's so important, right? Like, obviously, everybody knows we're on the investment side, and we're very data driven. Um, but so often, the data doesn't line up with the emotion or the feeling, right? It, it feels a lot better to go and try to pick the next big stock, the next Apple or whatever. But we all know that the data says that's not the most successful route. Same here, right? It's like, we know the data, but it's hard to grapple with the actual action. It's like, okay, I let my, you know, four-year-old run how far down the street, you know, and, and does he stop at the stop sign and not run out in the street? You know, and that's, a, that's a, a hard practice, obviously, but I think it's good, these reminders, and it does go back to the data, right? Like if you go back to the data and you're really trying to accomplish something, that's, that's what we should all rely upon um, and push ourselves, it, it sounds like, and maybe borrow some of that positive psychology that what's, what's the worst that can go can really happen type thing. But yeah, just one comment I'd want to, you know, make is it's interesting to me that before you redefined what positive psychology is, the default from what I've heard through social or these other things, it really is this, this feel good, um, all rainbows and butterflies, yet you're actually talking about developing tools and skill sets because of the resilience that's necessary to flourish as a human. That well-being is really defined of, of how do we have the skill sets to regulate our emotions and decisions, knowing that it is inevitable that we live in a broken world, that we live in the reality that 100% of people die, um, that we live in the reality that this is actually probably the safest time in history, at least in the United States, where, you know, I was joking around with my wife uh, yesterday is, you know, yeah, we're, we're so unsafe with our ADT alarm and, and our clean drinking water and, and like all of these realities that is, is when you start to look at past history, like, oh my goodness, could you imagine being terrified of like 
dying of animals and diseases on a daily basis. There's a reason. So I, I, it, this was really helpful for me to hear. Um, a question I have is just even somebody where we've had other therapists and people on this podcast, um, I think a lot of times I know we do this as parenting. It's like, it's this belief that we can control things. Um, and it was helpful when somebody, it's really like, it's a God complex, right? Like thinking that we can, that we can control all things. Can you talk about maybe what are some of these skill sets that we can set our kids up for success? Um, besides, you know, like, just, I guess, what are the most important skills? Yes. Letting them fight things out and cry a little bit. I think of a, a book called permission to feel by Mark Brackett from, from Yale. Like what are the things that parents need to know, um, that we're, we're preventing our kids from doing? Ooh, you guys have really good questions. Um, yeah. So, um, what are some of the things that you're saying listeners can actually do with their kids. Is that kind of what you're? Yeah. I, I think that that would be if, you know, it, we always ask this question, if, if I've got a five minute conversation with a parent and they say, Hey, I'm never going to get to meet you again. I can't read any more books. I can't listen to any more podcasts. What's the best life advice you can give me uh, that's going to have the biggest impact. Okay. So I, I, I will first agree with the first part of what you said about, you know, I think we give ourselves a little bit too much credit as parents that, you know, we don't have quite as big of a role. And again, this is, there's a lot of data and even, you know, studies on studies, the meta-analyses coming out that show that parents really don't have nearly as much control over outcome of their children's lives as they think they do. Um, so that's, that's totally true. At the same time, I do think there's certain things that we can do as parents um, to, to make it a little bit better for them. Um, one of the things that I do with my kids and one of the things that I do with my students that's super simple, and you've probably heard about it, is the three good things or three blessings exercise. Super simple, super effective. You know, um, it's, it's literally just what has gone well in the past 24 hours. And can you give me one thing? Can you give me two things? Can you give me three things? And it could be something really big, like, you know, they just won the state championships in flag football or whatever's big in a little kid's life, or it could be something really small, like chicken nuggets t tasted extra good at lunch today. Um, but I think that's something that's super small and effective. I know you guys have had different speakers uh, talk about this before, but from a biological perspective, it's much easier for us to focus on the negative, to ruminate on the negative, to sort of, you know, whatever, when something goes wrong, that's sort of what we hold on to. Those negative emotions is what we hold on to. This is a really simple, um, very quick, easy gratitude exercise that you can implement with anyone. And, you know, and I've seen this implemented with two-year-olds and I've seen it implemented with CEOs at like Fortune 500s and it's effective for everyone. But that's a really easy way if you do it three to five times a week um, to train yourself for a minimum of 30 days, I can look at a, uh, at a brain scan. I can look at a neuroimaging scan of your brain and I can see actual brain change where you're sort of rewiring your brain to also pay attention to the positive because it is so much easier um, to focus on the negative. And when we can do that, I mean, we all know, you know, we all have days where we get out of bed and we're in just kind of a crummy mood. And, you know, maybe there's a good reason for it or maybe not. But those, I'm sure those are the days where it's like hard to drag yourself to the gym and it's hard to call your clients or whatever, you know, whatever it is that you do. And then there's other days where we just happen to get out of bed and we're feeling better. And that gives us a lot of energy to sort of go conquer the day. And we think we can do anything on those days. And we tend to be more productive. We tend to have more energy. So cultivating this type of gratitude, building optimism over time, I think is something super easy to implement um, as a parent or as a teacher or as a coworker, or as a boss or as anybody. Um, so that's one little thing that I always tell everyone they should do because it's just so effective in so many different situations. Um, but other than that, as, as a parent, I mean, like I said, the biggest thing that I'm trying to do is really just give my kids, you know, realize that I'm not this... I don't control their lives in every way and I can't direct their lives in every way and trying to give them more opportunities to kind of struggle and, and not make everything, not try to solve everything for them, not try to fix everything for them and, you know, let them be okay when they're mad, let them be okay, like live in that mad space, live in that sad space, live in, in stressed out space so that they learn how to, how to do that for later on. Did that answer your question at all? 
Yeah. And it's helpful. I think of, uh, one of the things that we've implemented, I have a now, uh, almost six year old daughter, a three year old son, and then, and then a one month or a one year old is we started doing the five minute journal, uh, with her over a year ago. And it's the, you know, what am I grateful for? What's the, what's one thing that would make today great. And then the last question is I am, it's an identity statement. And then at the end of the evening, it's like, what went well? the day, what are you thankful for? And it really does. The funniest thing is when we started doing that with her is it, it forms and shapes us as parents. Uh, it totally, here I am trying to form and shape my child and it's actually making me answer these questions. And so uh, a follow-up question I'd love to hear you talk about is, is just where does identity fit in? It's interesting that we want our kids to have this individual success, but we're almost robbing them of having their own identity as we try to helicopter over them. Um, and so I just think it's interesting that, uh, where does identity fit into this conversation? Yeah. And it's interesting that you brought up a question about identity, because when you were talking about doing this activity with your daughter, I sort of thought, oh, this is great. You're also getting giving her the opportunity to reflect on her life and what she cares about. And, and I think that's really important as well. I think it's a really, I say this to my college students too, it's a really tough time to be a kid. It's a really tough time to be a high school student and a college student. I think you know, first of all, we live in a world that is incredibly just busy, right? Like we're overstimulated by stuff all the time. There's social media and all the comparison that comes with it and everybody's fake perfect lives that aren't really anything like they look at look at on social media. But I think the other part of it is there's so many expectations, you know, and maybe this comes from from this God complex that Eric mentioned as a parent, but you know, everybody wants their kids to kind of be the best and the greatest at something and make some big impact on the world. And that's really great. But on the other hand, I feel like we just put so much pressure on kids. So one of the things I see by the time that students get to college is like, they're on like a treadmill. They're on a hamster treadmill. It's just been, they do sports, they do clubs, they do social stuff. They do like, they're, ex you know, good grades. They're expected to do everything. It's so much about doing and one foot in front of the other and one foot in front of the other and and kind of they're all outside expectations. I don't I think we don't do a very good job giving kids enough space to figure out what's important to you. What do you care about? What do you want to do? What are you good at? Like what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And I'm not that doesn't even apply to to kids really. I think it's it's a broader statement on our culture where we've become such a culture of doing, right? Like that's what's appreciated is, is like grinding and hustling and grit and work, work, work and productivity. And I think that's great to an extent, but we've sort of forgotten what it means like to just be, right? Like we don't know how the, the being aspect of it. And, and I think that's really important too, because you, you know, I don't know if this happens to you guys. I mean, you work with athletes who are retired and trying to figure out the second phase of, of their life. And I think a lot of people, a lot of young people, a lot of students don't really know what they want, what they care about, what their values are. So I do a lot of that with them too, where it's like, you know, we spend a whole class, like a 90 minute period sorting through values and getting to like, what are your five highest, more, most important values? If you guys have heard of some of the research on character strengths, right? Like figuring out what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? How do you use your strengths to sort of prop up your weaknesses? But I think, I, yeah, the bottom line is, Eric, that I, I don't think we do enough. You know, we we talk the talk in terms of independence and, and individualism and uniqueness and so forth. But I don't think we actually give enough space and opportunity for kids um, or really anyone to kind of, you know, spend some time just kind of being bored and thinking about that kind of stuff. I think that's a, I mean, that's a fascinating point. And you brought up culture several times, right? And I think, how do we change culture? How do we shift culture? That's also a difficult thing. Um, but, you know, talking about the values, I think is really interesting because we have that, we try to have that conversation often because money is so tied to values and decision making. And I think of a conversation I have with a client this last week, in fact, and he's on a multi-year contract, he's got more money theoretically than he should ever need. Um, but it was really, you know, talking through like, why are you making certain decisions? Like, okay, you said you want, you know, you want to make more money off of the field 
than you made on it. And I'm, you already have more money than you're ever going to spend. So there's something else behind this. Like, let's dig a little bit deeper. But it seemingly, you know, I'm, I'm curious, why do you think we don't spend more time on that? You know, like, why, why are people afraid of it? Uh, is it lack of resources and process? Like, what? why don't we spend more time thinking about the values in this country specifically as opposed to, you know, Norway or, or one of these countries that maybe, you know, does spend more time on it? Gosh. Okay. So uh, first of all, I'm a, I'm, I'm a positive psychologist and I'm a cultural psychologist. So I do a lot of my work around the world and that's why I, I, I'm obsessed with thinking about cultures. Um, so I, I apologize if I brought that word up too much. Um, no, it's great. Um, why do, gosh, these are some like, Big, big <laughs> questions here. Um, I, I will say that one of the things I really liked about kind of learning more about you guys and what you do is, is you know, this idea that money isn't important just for money's sake. It's important for like what you can do with it and getting to do, you know, whether it's how you want to kind of have your impact on the world. So I, I really love that. Um, and I think that's really important to realize. I mean, one of the things that I do at the beginning of my positive psychology class is I, I, kind of look at what do students really want in life? What are they hoping to accomplish? And I've done this a bunch of times. Everyone has done this all over. And uh, it's always the same stuff. Like they they want to get a really good job, which means a really high paying job. They want to get, a, you know, the great house and the great um, car and the great, fa- you know, it's, it's like all these things that social media and TV and everything tells us that we should want and should have, and they're going to make us so much happier. And, um, you know, then I show them that like, that's not really what the data shows at all. (laughs) And, you know, money is very, very important when you don't have it, when you don't have enough money to live in a safe neighborhood, when you don't have enough money to feed your kids and to stay warm, money is very important. But once you hit a certain point where you can kind of live like a, a normal, safe life, money doesn't really contribute all that much to our happiness and well-being. Not anywhere near as much as people think. And neither does that fancy house or that fancy car or, you know, the the surgery face that looks five years younger or two years younger. None of that stuff really matters as much as we do, uh, as we think it does. What does matter though is, is, you know, relationships. Relationships are, there. there's a famous positive psychologist that died a few years ago, Chris Peterson, but he was doing an interview like this and they asked him, you know, what's the most important thing that you've learned in the past two, three decades of research and he's in, in positive psychology and he said, other people matter. So relationships are really important. We need to sort of spend more time on developing those relationships, deepening relationships. We're incredibly social creatures and we're meant to be together. Um, living in line with your values, having sort of meaning to your life, a purpose for like, why am I here? How do I contribute to this world? Um, those are the types of things that, that matter more. Uh, what was your other question? You guys, you do the like triple barreled. Yeah, I know. I, I feel like I'll, I'll, write I'll, them down. I'll, I'll, I'll try to go to one, but I'll actually divert and stick to one topic here too, because it's around this well being, And I think there's some famous research around the PERMA acronym. acronym. Um, So I'm, I'm wondering like if you could maybe explain that a little bit, because as I was preparing for this, reading through that, it was just so helpful, right? It's a framework to work through. It's a, it highlights, okay, what is well-being? It's not having a hundred million dollars, right? It's something else. And so I'd love to, if you're I'm sure you're familiar with it, but like if you find value in that, or maybe I'm taking this in a way you don't want to go, but I would love to hear your thoughts. Yeah. So PERMA is a sort of a theory of well-being that comes from Marty Seligman, who is this brilliant, brilliant professor researcher at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, he has a master's in applied positive psychology that he started there along with some other great people like Angela Duckworth. Um, and he, yeah, he's a really interesting guy because he is also quite famous um, for his work on learned helplessness as a model of for depression in the lab. So, um, 
you know, I won't really get into that, but a lot of his early work were really looking at depression. And then in the late 1990s, as the president of the American Psychological Association, he really kind of became famous as the father of positive psychology. But it's really interesting to kind of see his uh, progression in the field, because early on, when he started this field of positive psychology, his early book was called, I think, Authentic Happiness. Um, And then, you know, he sort of shifted away, like he he kind of cringes talking about happiness now and talks a lot more about flourishing and has this PERMA theory. So PERMA stands for positive emotions. So, you know, we're not saying that positive emotions don't matter, but again, it's not just about that Pollyanna smile. There's other emotions in there like love. Um, there's a lot of research showing how, you know, again, tied to relationships, but the, the emotion of love is so powerful. Um, e stands for engagement. Uh, so you guys have heard, I'm sure, of the term flow, right? So having an activity, whatever it is, whether you're doing, you know, you're, you're, you guys are baseball players, whether it was while you're playing baseball or whether it's you're running or you're an artist or you're a musician or you're crunching numbers, whatever it is, but feeling fully engaged with what you're doing in a way where you don't even realize time passes. It's just like you're in it. Um, R stands for relationships. So again, we kind of touched on that already, but M is meaning. Um, so having a purpose in life, like a why for why you exist, a why for why you get up in the morning. And then A is accomplishment. So um, accomplishment can mean very different things for different people. I think that's what in- what's interesting about all of this and, and taking the time to reflect, taking the time to figure out who you are and what's important to you is because all these things look very different from person to person. You know, accomplishment could be doing awesome on the football field, or it could be, um, you know, being the best parent that you could be if you're a stay at home parent, like accomplishment doesn't need to mean, you know, bringing in all, all the big bucks. Um, but anyways, I, I love PERMA. I think it's a, it's really, it's, it's really great to kind of shift away again from this conversation around happiness and realize that a life worth living, a good life, there's much more that goes into it. It's much more multifaceted and complex. There's been people, including Marty, that have sort of um, in recent years tried to add to that, you know, things like health um, and independence. And, you know, it's sort of like it grows and shrinks and grows and shrinks. But uh, those are kind of the main components of, of well-being as, as, as we look at it. That's kind of a popular theory in the field. Yeah, it's uh, th- th- thank you for explaining that. I think it's one of those things that whether it's on a podcast or even in a webinar or something, you know, PERMA will get dropped as if we're supposed to know it. It's like us financial people dropping our comments left and right. Uh, so it was it was super helpful to have you define that. I think the word that I that you've mentioned a few times that we've talked a lot about is, is this, this notion of flourishing that when we talk about wealth, we, we have this conversation of redefining wealth, because if you go back to the, the, uh, the old English word, it actually means well-being. Um, it, it isn't money. And so there's this tracing to, of essentially saying, how do we set your life up to have the impact to flourish, uh, which is having the energy and the health to show up as the best version of yourself in the projects and the relationships that matter most. So it's this really interesting thing that I think, uh, consumerism has us so distracted trying to sell us on the good life through our material possessions and through our hundreds of thousands of followers, but not our friendships of virtue. Um, And I think it's this really helpful thing and challenging to, we know this, that all of the research when it goes on the deathbed, right? It's not the, I wish I had a bigger house. It's, you know, the few people that can probably fit in your hospital room um, of the things that matter most. And so it's just always good to hear this challenge. And it's interesting. One of the things I've learned the most by parenting and and, uh, the information you've shared here is what's really good for how we're trying to develop our children's probably really good for us as adults. Um, we're just, as you said, trying to go back to traditional psychology to undo all of the bad stuff. Um, so we're one thing I want to clarify and just make sure is an affirmative. Yes. Is like, 
it's not too late, right? Like this, uh, this is still as adults, you've heard these, I think, hopefully lies that, hey, once you hit, hit 16, you're kind of done. You've baked and you're cooked. I mean, what advice do you have for us as the adults, the professional athlete, the CEO, the, the mom, the entrepreneur, the people that are listening on this podcast, they go, that's great. I can try and apply this to my kids, but how about if this is stuff that I need to take, you know, is it, is it too late for us, the adult to make these changes? Sure. Oh, so many great things in there. First of all, I love that you brought up the deathbed. Um, I think that's a really great exercise uh, that I also do with students uh, is have them imagine what their deathbed is like. And I know that sounds sort of dark and terrible, but it's really, yeah, who's there? What are they saying about you? You know, who do you want there and what do you want them to be saying about you? And I think that's a really good exercise to realize, like, it's not about that house. It's not about how much you have in the bank account. It's not, you know, like, that's not who you want there. That's not what you care about at the end of life. Um, in terms of, is it too late? Absolutely not. Um, so I think this is probably the most exciting discovery in my field of psychology in the past two, three decades. Until two, three decades ago, we really thought, like Eric said, that most change at the brain level really happened during the first few years of life, that maybe up until puberty, but then afterwards, you know, that was it. You're kind of stuck. This is this is who you are, and there's no further change. And maybe the only kind of other change that we would admit to would be in later age, you know, like, oh, you're getting really old, dementia's like it's a decline, right? Like you've had a stroke and it's going terribly. And we now know that that's not true at all. Um, there is change that happens throughout our entire life on a very kind of like physical, biological level. I can see change in your brain. And what's really exciting about that is you really have so much control over it. So even, you know, the foods you eat, right? Like we all talk so much about nutrition and I'm sure you guys as athletes have thought about nutrition. Eating things like fish, eating things like blueberries isn't good just for your heart and for your muscles and all that. It's good for your brain. Um, there's some really cool studies actually showing that eating crunchy food, so eating crunchy food as opposed to eating mushy food has benefits for your brain. Um, so there was this kind of early, there's this early classic studies. You guys seem to know a lot about this. So if, if you've already heard about it, I apologize. But there's this really great study. I think it came out in the early 90s. This is one of the first neuroimaging studies that really came to popularity. And it was looking at taxi drivers in London. Have you heard of this? No, no, no. <laughs> so I don't know if you've been to London or not, but London is a very crazy city. There's a lot of a lot of streets and they're sort of tingled like a big messy spider web. It's a city that wasn't planned. It sort of evolved organically. And it turns out that becoming a taxi driver in London um, is extremely difficult. I think they go to school for something like three years full time, something like six hours a day. You have to memorize thousands and thousands and thousands of, of streets. And again, this is, you know, before everyone had GPSs that the study was done. But what they looked at is they looked at people who had been taxi drivers for a really long time versus new taxi drivers versus people that weren't taxi drivers. And we showed that there's there's a part of the brain that's really involved with um, spatial memory and spatial recognition called the hippocampus. And that part of the brain was actually larger in taxi drivers. And it was larger the longer they had been in the job. So that was one of the first studies to really show us in a very concrete way what we do has very clear sort of impact on our brain. Like you, the same way that you work out your muscles, you can work out your brain. So this is this idea of, of neural plasticity that it's flexible, it's changeable. We can do things to change it. Even newer research um, is coming out showing that there's something called neurogenesis. So neurons are brain cells. And we used to think that, you know, the neurons you had at birth, there's the neurons you always have. And it turns out that that's not true, that we're, we're able to grow new neurons, especially in certain parts of the brain, again, the hippocampus. So something like, I read a study recently that by the time you turn 50, you've completely replaced Place the neurons that you were born with. Um, so, and again, what, what is really cool about this research is so much of it is in your hands. You know, so again, the foods you eat, um, getting physical exercise, especially, you know, cardiovascular exercise is really helpful. Pushing yourself to constantly learn and exercising things, practicing things, especially things that are really difficult. So repeated practice, but also practice of really hard stuff, things that, you know, like we all have that subject um, in, 
in high school or college that was like really hard. And you're like, oh, I'm just not good at that. Pushing yourself on those things is really one of the best things you could do for your brain. That's why I was like, I was terrible. I called it sadistics back in the day. I have a master's in statistics now, but you know, like I was terrified of it. But yeah, working on really complicated things, exposing yourself to new things. So travel, you know, whether it's to a foreign country or just to a place in town that you never go to, but exposing yourself to things that make you uncomfortable, that are new, doing positive psychology exercises, um, whether it's the gratitude exercise or practicing mindfulness or practicing savoring or just doing yoga, all these things we see have a tremendous impact in a very, now we know in a very kind of like, physical, biological way, I can track change in your brain. Um, and that to me is just like, so exciting. Yeah. I, I, I love it. And I know Brandon's going to close this out, but I get so excited when you start to talk about these things. It was, uh, I got turned on to the book. This is your brain on food, uh, uh from, um, Dr. Uma, Nadu, I think is, is her name from, from Harvard. Uh, and, and talking oh, I about you guys are reading and, and doing so much. Like, I oh, love that you guys know so much about this. And it, well, it's fascinating. It's the whole reason we started this podcast, right? The human capital podcast to think about, you can invest in yourself, right? Through your, your physical ability, your intellectual ability. And then what we call, you know, your, so, your social capital, the, your, your network of relationships is to go, like we have been created as these fascinating creatures that can grow and in so many different ways and food as an athlete, I always just thought about it as kind of like macros, calories in calories out. How do I put on some weight? Not the, the impact on my brain, right. In my emotional health and depression and anxiety and these type of things. And so just, it, it's so fun to learn that no matter how old you are, right. You can continue to develop, um, and, and really unlock it. And then the last thing I'll say and let Brandon close out is just, I think you've hit on a few things and it's why we're also so fascinated by the immigrant story is, uh, it's really hard to understand our own position in life or culture when we've never seen outside of it. Right. I think it's, uh, uh, the, uh, the Kipling quote of, you know, it's, it says, and what should they know of England who only England know? And I, that, that just hit me in the sense of a lot of times we don't understand ourselves till we can get outside of ourselves, outside of our culture. And so that's just a, a really big challenge. So I appreciate, I want to say thank you personally. I've, I've loved this conversation. I'll let Brandon close out, but uh, thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much for your kind words. I've been so impressed. I love how much you guys know, how much you guys have been reading. Can I just add one little thing about aging? Absolutely. It's been long, but um, before I was doing this parenting research, a lot of my research was actually looking at aging across cultures of the world, across national cultures. And I looked at something like 40 different countries. Um, and one of the things that's really interesting is like when you ask people what they want in old age, people have this like, I want to be sitting back on a beach sort of view of like doing as little as possible. And it turns out that you know, the, the people that are happiest are the ones that work as long as, as they can. And then again, not because they have to, but because they want to and stay engaged and learning and pushing themselves um, as long as possible. So the bottom line is that change is possible and growth is possible throughout the entire lifespan. And it contributes a tremendous amount to, to well-being too, and to even putting a smile on your face. So <laughs> Oh, this has been so fantastic. And I was going to ask you to leave, you know, if there's anything parting words, but I, that, I don't know how you could top that. So, um, yeah, I just have appreciated this more than, you know, um, I know this has been a wide ranging all over the map, uh, discussion, but I think people are just really going to take a lot of gold out of this. So Speranda, we really appreciate you being here, um, sharing all of your knowledge, uh, with us. I uh, definitely want to throw out to everybody listening. Uh, we all need to go on a 30 day gratitude blessings challenge. That is uh, what you told me that night when we, when we spoke was uh, the three blessings. I said, well, I usually do one with the kids, you know, in prayers at night. What are you thankful for? It's been up to three ever since. Um, and I think it's uh, definitely shown, shown value. So Appreciate that first conversation we've had. I appreciate the conversation we've had today. We'll link to the show in the show notes to all the resources that were were discussed. Um, we'll include some way uh, to get into touch with you if that's possible. Um, but thank you, thank you so much. And with that, 
Uh, own your wealth, make an impact, and always be a pro. Thank you.